All of this is coming together. If you don't have a handout at the moment, uh, you just have got one on as you were entering. If you don't have a handout, would you just put your hand up and the ushers will get you one. Uh, fellas, there's some here to the front, please. Uh, so I, what I'm going to endeavor to do this evening, Lord helping us, is to go through and identify some things that the Lord has spoken of and prophe- prophecies of the Old Testament that are yet to be fulfilled. These prophecies are not prophecies that we can say, well, that could have happened at a certain event in history, because for all of it to come together, it can only be achieved uh, during the tribulation period. And in the past, the last session that we had, if you've missed that one, session 10, we spoke about the uh, the, the seven seal judgments. We went through all of them, uh, and there is a handout for that, and you could listen to the message again. Uh, but through that, we see that the first horse was a, a white horse with him coming on it, and uh, the one with a bow in his hand, and that was the revelation of Antichrist. Uh, Antichrist will be a political figure who will make, who will make a, a, an agreement with Israel and will bring political peace to the region, and then he will defend them and allow them to build their temple. And, uh, and then in the middle of that tribulation period, he will break his covenant and will turn on to Israel. But our interest this evening is to see how, how the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, get my clicker to work, how the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, fits in. And uh, we're going to go through those two chapters, uh, and we're going to see what God is doing in that end time event. And I've called this to be the Russian and Islamic invasion. There's going to be an alliance, an alliance between Russia and Islamic nations uh, that will come and they will form battle against Uh, Israel, and uh, the Lord will have to deliver Israel through that period of time. And we're going to look at the prophecy that is found in Ezekiel 38 and 39 tonight. Uh, You're asking me, well, where does that fit in into end time events? I believe that this fits in round about the red horse, which is one of great wars. And between, so between the red horse and the sixth seal, which is the seal of the great earthquake that will take place in Revelation chapter 6. So somewhere in there, I believe this event is going to take place. All right, let's have a look together, Ezekiel chapter 38, and we'll start our study. Before that, let's have a word of prayer, asking the Lord to help us. Lord, we thank you for your grace and goodness. Thank you for bringing us together again. Thank you, Lord, that you are still in control of world affairs. Help us tonight to look into your word and gain a biblical worldview. Lord, that will help us, that will encourage us, that will uh, stir us, Lord, to understand that that time is uh, running out and we need to do all we can as we reach people with the gospel. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 38. And the Bible says this in verse 1, Ezekiel 38. I hope you found that. That's just before Daniel, Ezekiel, Daniel. And if you're there, say amen. Amen. Okay, good. So we're ready to go. Ezekiel chapter 38, and let's read together. The Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, that is to Ezekiel, saying, A son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshul, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against them, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya, with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Verse 6, Gomer and all his bands, the house of 
Togama of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel which have been always waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. All right, there's much more which will continue, but uh, this here, we, we note some things. We note that God is the one who is stirring Gog to bring him in against Israel with all the company and affiliation of nations. Let's stop right here and let's begin to define some of these terms. The word Gog right, is the name or a title ascribed to a ruler, like Pharaoh. Pharaoh is not the name of a person, it is a title of the king of Egypt. The Tsar. Tsar was uh, the, uh, the ruler of uh, Russia. So we have different labels and names given uh, to rulers. And so here the name or the title Gog is for a chief prince, for a ruler that rules in the land of Magog. Right? The land of Magog. So I want to help us tonight to identify these biblical names to where they are really today geographically. And you've got those in your notes, but we're going to point them out tonight. All right, well, first thing I want you to write down, which I left out of your notes, write down next to the reference there in number one, where we talked about Ezekiel, uh, the nations. I want you to write down the table of nations is found in Genesis chapter 10. The table of nations, so where all these names have come from, is found in Genesis chapter 10. And from that we find, from the children of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, out of them came all the nations. And if you remember, they all spoke the one tongue until the Tower of Babel, and then God came down and uh, confounded their language. And then they split into all the world. And, and so we have then in Genesis chapter 10, the record for us of the table of nations and where they went. So from that we find out in this map that we have, so there's an alliance of nations uh, that are involved. And, and I, I think if you look at this, that's, let me bring my notes with me because I'm not going to remember them out of the top of my head. Uh, so let's have a look here. All right, when, uh, when we look at the different nations, okay, where, where are they? So Magog, there's my laser. Hey, it's interesting, the laser doesn't hit the, the screen. It won't work. Get rid of it, no. Uh, so, okay, so let's have a look here. So Magog, Magog is in that northern region up the top. How is it that it doesn't work on it? It's too bright. You better buy me a better one then for next time. Thank you, Dave. All right, so, so here we have, if you look right at the top, Magog is that area of that northern part of which now is Russia. Okay, so Russia is there. So here, if the chief ruler of Magog, who is called by God, the title of Gog, then it must be someone who is a leader in that empire, the Russian Empire, right, of Russia. So Russia is going to be drawn, and it's got also uh, its region. So where we look at Meshech, here, remember in our reading we talked about Meshech, and Meshech is that southern part of Russia, which ends up in where we've got Georgia and Azerbaijan, and that's coming down towards Turkey, and where we look at Tubal, Goma, and Togama, so you can see them there on your map. That's present-day Turkey, right? So Turkey's involved. And uh, then we have a, a names of Persia, which we know is Iran. So coming from that side, from the east there, Iran coming across. 
Then we have Ethiopia, which is down the bottom there. That's north of Sudan, which is very Islamic right now. Uh, these nations are coming from the south. And Libya, which is uh, to the west of Egypt, you'll see there Libya. Uh, these nations are going to have a, an alliance with Russia. Now, if you, if you think about Russia right now, it has a great alliance with Persia, Iran. A lot of Iran's, uh, 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 their chemical and, and nuclear development is helped and funded with Russia. If you look at the alliances that are taking place right now, uh, uh, Hezbollah in the south of Lebanon, who are they funded by? It's Iran, and, and they are also found in Syria at the same time. So if, I can't get you this clicker, but if you look around Israel, all of these nations are forming these alliances, these Islamic alliances with Russia for a reason. Uh, that God is uh, uh, orchestrating this. He's allowing this to take place uh, because he's going to be glorified. The nations of the world are going to see that he is God. And uh, he, is, uh, he, he is allowing these alliances to take place. You know, we, we at the moment think about why is this happening? As, why is the world going mad? Listen, uh, God knew about this uh, two and 3,000 years ago. And uh, he knew already the future from the time of this prophecy. And this prophecy is yet to be fulfilled. This has not taken place yet. But it is, we look at the events of the world today and we can certainly see that the stage is being set. And these things are moving, these puzzles, uh, these uh, pieces of our puzzle are just coming together quite nicely. And uh, we see all this is taking place for what reason? For what reason? God will always be true to his word. God's word will always be fulfilled. And uh, that's why it's important uh, for us as Christians to understand the events of the world around us, not through the eyes of the news media, not through the eyes of the secular people who are reporting, but I believe we need to have a biblical worldview to understand how God is moving in our time today. And when we begin to see God at work, we need to be ready. We need to be ready in understanding that God is moving. God is working through the affairs of this world, and, and we need to be ready as Christians. And uh, uh, the saddest thing is when Christians are being lazy and dismissing of what is taking place. I really believe that the Lord is at hand. Uh, when we're seeing everything that is taking place, there's no doubt that the Lord is nearer, nearer in coming. Hey, if anything, today is one day closer. If anything, today was one day closer. And uh, the Lord promised that he will return. But we're seeing today, we're seeing that the events of this world are, are, just, are just coming together. They're coming together for a reason. They're coming together for a purpose. And God will be magnified and his purposes will be accomplished here on earth. And so we see these nations forming an alliance. And God writes about it and he says to God, he says, you better be ready. Uh, they're going to be drawn to Israel. Uh, they got, the Bible tells us that they're going to be fitted with great weaponry. Look what he said uh, to, the, to him uh, in verse 4. And all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And uh, we find that this is going to be a great army that is well, uh, well fitted uh, with all the equipment, all the artillery that is needed. So could we see today uh, that Russia is well equipped? Uh, do we see some of these alliances of these nations that they're already ready? Uh, you, you saw that uh, on, Oct on October 7th, uh, when the uh, invasion took place, what, did you see the snippet of the Iranian parliament? What did the Iranian parliament do? They, they were chanting. Uh, they were happy about what was taking place. And, and when you look at that, you see, okay, these alliances are really there. This, all of this is happening, and it's working even in our day today. So when we look at the scripture of Ezekiel chapter 38, we find that Russia together with some of all these Islamic nations. Now, if you look at Turkey, Turkey was very secular, but the current president that they have, 
He's trying to turn the nation to go back into real Islamic Sunni uh, uh, Sharia law. So these things are just happening as, as we're living today. If you just read the news, look at, say, you know, stay abroad, l- 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 listen to what's happening around the world. You begin to see that these alliances, these things are taking place to, for, to fulfill God's purpose and to fulfill the prophecy that is given to us in the Word of God. So we find that they're prepared, uh, they've got all the uh, artillery that they need, all the weaponry, and God says to him, come, you come, and I'm ready for you. Come, and I'm ready for you. And so Gog is, is being drawn, he's coming uh, he's making his alliances and trying to make his way down to Israel. And I think if, when we look at the world stage, we see that there's great evidence of that taking place right now. All right, let's look at the timing of the invasion. When will this take place? How is this going to happen? And so verses 8 and 9 gives us uh, the, the clue. After many days, thou shalt be visited. It's going to be, here the word is trying to show us that it, it's not at the time of this prophecy. It's not at the time when Ezekiel was penning down this prophecy. It was going to be after many days. In fact, he continues to say these words, in the latter years. Whenever you see these words in Scripture in the Old Testament, of the latter years or the latter days, it's referring to that end time event where we find ourselves through the tribulation period or through the millennial kingdom. But we find here, so this event is going to take place somewhere in that vicinity. Let's have a look at what are the criteria. What are the timing criteria for that invasion? Number one, it says after many days in the latter years. And so this term defined, identifies a period with the tribulation or the end time events. And number two, a time when the land is brought back from the sword. It's a time when the land is brought back from the sword. When was it that Israel or that that land that God promised them uh, came back out of great war? Right? It was it came out uh, from that period back from the sword. The British government established that state of Israel after World War II. Uh, so we find that that's when they moved into the nation, uh, back in 1948. Number C, when God gathered them from many nations to the mountain of Israel. Jews have been coming back to Israel. Interesting, interesting that with this current war, that how many of them have gone back to Israel to be part of the reserve army, to get back and to defend their nation. I mean, if, you, if you're seeing stuff that is being recorded, you say, well, what's going on? And so they've been gathered, they're coming back into their nation, number D, which had been a continual waste. Uh, the land was uh, inhabited by a certain uh, number of people, but it was very unproductive. Today, if you ever go, get a chance, we were going to go, uh, but we're not going anymore. But uh, if you ever get a chance or you look things up on YouTube or you, uh, you, you know, search on Google about Israel, uh, Israel, its productivity today is far greater than what it was ever before. Uh, There are more trees planted, there's more greenery in Israel today than what there was ever in history. Uh, So uh, there's a great production, there's a great uh, agricultural uh, advancement in Israel today. And so we find that these are all meeting now uh, the timeline that God is is, is setting. Uh, Number three, it is brought forth out of the nations. It uh, It is the identification of the land to be the independent state of Israel. I think when we look at all these things that have taken uh, place in our modern history, we find that we are sitting in a timeline, in a time period where uh, this particular prophecy uh, can come about. And number F, uh, Israel is dwelling safely, protected by some accord of political alliance. Now, this is the one, the one time, uh, this is the one description Right, of the timeline that has not been satisfied yet. Israel is not dwelling safely in the land. All right? Everything else has been satisfied. But we're waiting on one more thing, one more event to take place in order for this particular prophecy to take place. 
for this prophecy of Gog with his alliances to make an advance on Israel. And what is that one final one? For Israel to dwell, to, to dwell safely. When is that going to happen? When is Israel going to dwell safely or they feel like they're being protected in their land? Not that they've got peace, it's not, not peace, but they feel protected or insulated. You know when that's going to happen? According to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, that's the time when the Antichrist, who is a political figure, will come and will make an accord or an agreement uh, with Israel. Uh, he will give them what they need. He will allow them to reestablish their worship on the mount and give them their temple. And he will protect them. He will give them this false protection. He'll bring a solution to the, trouble, uh, to the troubled Middle East. If you look at our events today, do you think there is trouble in the Middle East? You think there's going to be any solution by any political figure today? I mean, we've got protesters going down and trying to, uh, trying to lobby our Prime Minister, Mr. Albanese, to put pressure on Israel uh, that they will cease fire. And, uh, as if we, and this is what I'm saying, the world has a different view to what the Bible tells us is going to take place. But what is taking place? is that this turmoil that is happening in the Middle East, someone has to bring a solution to it. Someone has to uh, uh, resolve the conflict. Someone, because if you've seen the conflict now, it's not only between Gaza and uh, you know, the Gaza Strip and Israel. Uh, the, the, there is uh, inflammation of this stuff taking place everywhere, in the West Bank, in the south of Lebanon, uh, in different countries and nations with that, which they are uprising even right now and, uh, and, and being drawn into this very war that is taking place. Someone has to come and bring a solution. In my opinion, in my opinion, that's going to be the Antichrist. That's going to be a political figure who will rise out of Europe, and uh, it could be anybody out of the uh, European Union. We don't know who it is, and the, the Bible does not tell us to go and search for who he is, and not to look for his appearing. We ought to be appearing, looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ. But here is someone that is going to bring a solution to the Middle East. And when he brings this solution to them, when he brings this solution to them, then Israel is dwelling safely in the land. And can I remind you that that is not going to take place until Jesus returns and take the church to be home. Right? The event of the rapture will take place before we see this final uh, this, this final uh, criteria to be satisfied and for Israel to dwell safely in the land. So we see then scriptures talking about an event then that is definitely going to take place and it's going to take place after the church is raptured. And number G, it will be when he comes, it'll be like a storm, it'll be a sudden, he'll break out violently and suddenly will move in upon Israel. So what is the purpose of this invasion? Why, why is this going to take place? Well, the Bible tells us in, in chapter 38 and verse 13. Sorry, verse, uh, where, where am I? Uh, verses 9, verse 9 through to 12. Uh, Thou shalt send and come like a storm. Uh, verse 9, verse 10. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil Thought, thou shalt think an evil thought, to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. What, what, is, he, what is he coming for? Yeah, well, he wants to come and take all the material wealth. You know uh, that Israel... Has got the is one of the leaders in diamond mining. Uh, you, there's so much wealth in Israel today, and so much prosperity that is taking place. Uh, there's great reserves as well, uh, you know, with oil, etc. And uh, so these nations are going to eye the prosperity. They're going to see, well, why are you being protected? Why, why, why are you getting special treatment? Uh, and uh, you've got so much wealth that uh, we're going to come and plunder it. We're going to come and take it. Uh, they want the material wealth of silver, gold, cattle, and goods. And not only that, uh, they want to take the land uh, uh, which they dwell, that, that, that dwell in the midst of the land. 
Uh, the land of Israel is very strategic. It's a very strategic, it's an important land. Through it comes all the connection, the connection of the north with the south. And so it is very strategic. If you can control that, you can control trade, you can control uh, with taxes, you can control uh, economics. And so it is very important uh, to him that he gets a hold of it. And so they're coming to take, uh, they want to invade, they want to take the wealth of Israel. Uh, but here the Bible tells us that there will be those who will oppose it. Verse 13, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? You find in this verse that some who are identified, Sheba and Dedan are identified as Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia and another maybe could be the Yemen uh, that is in that peninsula, uh, they will oppose. They, they will say, why, why are you doing this? Why are you coming down? Are you here just to take the wealth out of Israel? Uh, not only them, but the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof. Let me help you identify who, they, who that would be. Uh, the merchants of Tarshish are the Western nations like England and America. Uh, now, the, the, the young lions, the young lions, what did Britain do? They colonized right? They colonized Canada. So it could be places like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and other British Commonwealth uh, countries. Uh, They're going to rise up. Uh, They're going to uh, oppose what is taking place. There'll be protests, etc., like what we're seeing. And, uh, but they will not get, they will not engage in any military activity to protect Israel. So uh, it's nothing really different to what we're seeing today, right? Uh, you know, we, we, we like it, we, we're with you, we're with you, but we're not going to get involved. And uh, so this is what will take place, even at that time, that uh, these uh, will see, uh, they will observe what's taking place, they will question, and, uh, and they, will, uh, they will oppose his motives for coming down to Israel. Number five, uh, God's ultimate purpose for bringing God against his people is to teach the nations that, to acknowledge the Lord. Verse 16. And the Bible says this, And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, underline those words, the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. I want you to uh, just see a couple of things here. Uh, When we look at all these criteria. There has never been a time in history where Russia had alliances with these Islamic nations to come against Israel. Right? Nowhere through history. So this prophecy, you cannot take this prophecy and say, well, that happened in this event or happened in that event. If you're looking at the criteria to the fulfillment of this prophecy, these criteria have not been fulfilled as yet. But there will be. There will. There will be coming. And uh, so he, he says to him, you're going to come in those latter days, and you're going to come against my land, and the, the heathen will know me. God has a purpose for this attack, for this invasion, that he will deliver his people, and the heathens will know the God of Israel. He says that when I shall be sanctified in the O Gog before their eyes. God will get the glory through this. And the next uh, portion of the scripture as we read, uh, we find how God is going to protect his people and protect his land. In the next uh, following verses from 17 uh, right through to 23, and then 39 uh, verses 1 to 6, we see what God is going to do. The Bible says this, that thus saith the Lord God, art thou he of whom I have spoken in all time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. Uh, God, uh, in his anger and righteous wrath, is now going to deal uh, with these Gentile nations. Verse 19, For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely 
in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. God is going to deliver. He is going to, in his anger and in his wrath against these nations that are coming against his land and against his people, he's going to bring a great shaking. There's going to be a great earthquake. There's going to be a great earthquake that will take place when, when the Lord will defend his people. So when they come, they will come like a storm. There will be multitudes of them coming down to Israel there, and then God will send a great earthquake. Now, this is similar to the great earthquake that we mentioned in Revelation chapter 6 in that last seal, the sixth seal. And uh, so a great nation that will shake. And that the Bible says here that it's going to affect marine life. Look what God continues to say in verse 20. So that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all, and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places, that is the cliffs, shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. Does that sound like a great calamity? Does that sound like God is going to shake the earth in a great way that uh, a lot of things are going to change? Uh, he, he gives us specifics that even the, 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 uh, the fish in the sea, the marine life is going to feel it. Uh, the birds are going to feel it. The, the beasts of the field are going to feel it. And they're going to suffer through it. And every creeping thing. And men shall understand and see that this is my wrath. And, and mountains will fall. And cliffs will crumble. And uh, great walls will fall. And the Bible tells us that Gog's army, in verse 21, And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. Gog's army will turn on each other to kill one another. Does that sound familiar to another story in the Bible? Does it sound familiar that God confuses the enemy? Uh, Sennacherib, remember, uh, the Syrian army that got confused and they got up and started killing each other? Uh, you, you've heard, you remember reading that story? And so we find here God uses the same thing. Here they are going to be so confused about what's taking place that they're going to, uh, they're going to be in delusion and they're going to kill one another. Uh, there's going to be a great, uh, that they're going to annihilate each other. Uh, and he says this, And I will plead against him with pestilence, verse 22, and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands, and upon many people that are with him, and overflowing rain, and great hailstones of fire, and brimstone. And brimstone. Let's have a look. Uh, God is, uh, is going to send a plague of bloodshed. Uh, this could be a chemical warfare that they will use against each other. Uh, God will also send Gog's army and overflowing rain. There's going to be so much rain uh, that there will be mudslides, that their equipment is going to be stuck and immobilized, uh, derailed military equipment and convoys. Uh, great hailstones are going to fall from heaven. Uh, to kill men uh, and, and the volcanic activity of fire and will spill, that will spill fire and brimstone that will destroy his army. I mean, is God able to do that? Is God able to destroy the enemy? God is able to make himself known. Verse 23, this will I magnify myself and sanctify myself. And I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. How do you think all the nations are going to witness what is going to take place? It says all the nations shall know. That device that sits in your pocket right now, that streams, you're going to see it. You're going to see the event, just like how you saw some of the events that took place uh, on October 7th. In that invasion, that we got real-time footage. You're going to get people are going to get real-time footage of what God is going to do in destroying Gog and the alliance that is with him. Let's have a look in, verse, in chapter 39. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God: Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn thee back. So some are going to survive this onslaught by God, and, I, and leave but a sixth part of thee. Only one-sixth 
of that invading army will survive the destruction that God will bring upon them. One-sixth, which means five-sixths are going to be destroyed. Five-sixths of that army are going to be destroyed. And he says that one-sixth will return, will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. And I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds, and of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. And I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell in carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. What the Bible tells us here is the army is going to be destroyed. Only one-sixth will survive. But then God is going to send fire to destroy Magog, which is Russia, and also to those isles that live carelessly. What I think is going to take place there, and this is my personal opinion, is that there will be a nuclear war. I think uh, uh, what will take place is both Russia and America will try to nuke each other, and uh, some of the other isles that live carelessly, like Australia and New Zealand, and other nations that live carelessly, that is, they have no time for God, no consideration for God, they're living carelessly today, and they will continue to live carelessly after the Lord returns and takes the church away, and God is going to bring judgment upon these nations, and there will going to be great destruction. Why? For what purpose? That they shall know that I am the Lord. That people will know this is God. You need to turn to him. Many will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus through this period of time. And, and uh, what a terrible time of events to be there, to live during that period of time. You know, people say that, you know, the first three and a half years of the tribulation are really not severe and it's just going to be easy going and, and it'll just get worse after the midpoint. Let me tell you, when you begin to read and study prophecy, you'll understand that it was horrific right from the get-go. And the things that are going to take place, the terror, the wars, the, the, the famines, uh, uh, the, you know, the short supply of things, e economies are going to fail. Uh, you're going to understand that this is not a time or a season to be born in or to live in. And so God will be glorified through these events. Uh, the Israelites will burn the weapons. If, you go to, if we go down now to verse 9, and they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, which is, uh, uh, and the hand staves and the spears, uh, that they shall burn them with fire for how long? For seven years. It's going to take them seven years to burn all the equipment and all the artillery that has been brought down to, to, to invade them. For seven years they will burn it. Uh, this may mean that some of this will continue to burn, maybe even through a part of the millennial reign. Uh, for seven years, uh, this will take place. Uh, you know, you've seen, you've seen some oil fields where that, you know, there's fire that has been lit, and the fire just continues for days and days and months and years, and it continues to burn. This is what's going to happen. They're going to burn all that equipment. Not only that, not only are they going to burn the weapons for seven years, but I want you to have a look from verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel. There's going to be mass graves. There's going to be a mass grave to, to bury all these people. Look what he says. Uh, 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 in the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of passengers. And, they shall, and there shall they bury Gog and all his multitudes, and they shall call it the valley of Ham and Gog. Uh, he says they're going to stop their noses. That the stench of death is going to be around for months and months. And, and as they walk around, they're going to have to hold their noses because of the death and the, and, you know, the, the decomposed bodies that are going to be around. And look, it says, and seven months, verse 12, and seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them, and that, that they may cleanse the land. It's going to take seven months. It's going to take seven months to clean up the dead bodies and bury them. And now when you begin to think about that and begin to just fathom the number of people 
fathom what God is going to do in that event. Uh, this would not be, poor, uh, little Israel is not going to defend itself against this number of a great army that is going to come against them. God is the one who is going to deliver them. And so we find that the, as God will kill off five, six of the army, that it's going to take them seven months, seven months for them to bury the dead. And the nations will see the glory of God. Verse 21, so the house of Israel also shall know that I am the Lord, their God, from that day forward. What's going to happen is that Israel is going to repent. Israel is going to come to know the Lord. Israel, through this great deliverance, is going to see that their only hope is God himself. So the house of Israel shall know that I am God. And, and that God is working through the events uh, to judge the Gentile world that is unbelieving, that is against him, but is also reproving his own people, uh, reproving the, cha- the nation of Israel that they would come to believe on him and know him. In verse 7, back in verse 7, uh, he said this, So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. God is going to be magnified through these circumstances. And then the the rest of the chapter of uh, chapter 39 uh, is a promise to Israel of a future protection. The future promise of gathering them into one place. Pouring out his spirit upon them. And this will be the end of the tribulation period according to Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. God, even though through these circumstances, God still has a purpose in regathering and fulfilling. Remember, this, all this period is God keeping his promise to Abraham and to David in fulfilling his promise in gathering the people again as a nation. They will come out from all the nations then And by the end, God will bring them in one place. And they will believe on him whom they had slain. They will see the nail prints in his hand and believe on him whom they had slain. And that then God will pour his spirit upon them. And they will be saved. And they will be ushered into the millennial reign. God has a timeline in which he is working through the affairs of our world. Today... We sit back and we see news snippets. I want you today to begin to think, Lord, could this be it? Lord, are we just in the final days? Lord, are we living in a time where we may even experience your return? Lord, please come. Please come. And the Bible tells us to pray for the peace of of Jerusalem. You know when you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you know what that is for? For Jerusalem to have peace, they can only have peace when the King of Peace comes and dwells with them. So to pray that prayer is to invite the Lord to say, Lord, would you come? Would you come and fulfill your time plan? Would you come and take the church? Would you begin to do a work with your people to bring them to repentance? God, would you please fulfill your promises to your people and to us as a church? God has given us a promise as a church that he will come and he will take us to be with him. Are you ready? Are you ready to meet the Lord? Is your life right? If the Lord was to come, is your life right? You might need to get some things right. You might need to get your life right with God even today. Because surely, as I look at the events of the world around me, I cannot but say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. The Lord is at hand. Amen? Maranatha, the Lord is at hand. All right, any questions before we conclude tonight? Anybody has any questions? Yes, Brother Michael. No, that's a different event. Uh, that, that event is at the end when, when Satan will be released 
uh, for a short while, so I, that's at the end of the millennial reign, where he will go back again and he will draw a nation and he will draw people again one more time with a final attempt to come and uh, to have a go against God, uh, against Christ's kingdom, because Christ's kingdom will be in Jerusalem. So he'll be having his final attempt and God will destroy him at that event. That's when he'll be cast into the lake of fire. And then we find uh, Revelation 20 tells us that we then see the great white throne judgment. All right, any other questions? Michael. Um, not a question, but just a statement that was interesting. Verse 13, Sheba and Dedan, Saudi yep. Arabia. You look, this is the first time in history that Saudi Arabia and Israel have actually tried to come together and make peace. Yep. So that's all lining up as well. Yep, so Sheba and Dedan. Uh, so, but they will not, they will not uh, interfere in, in any military force, but they will speak out against it. Any other question? Oh, there's a lot of reference to swords and bows and arrows. Is that symbolic or is that actually a technical shutdown of actual artillery? Or? Uh, well, that's reading into it. I think the, the prophet Ezekiel, uh, in what he was writing, that, that at that time, that's all that, you know, what he saw would not be able to explain you know, in their terminology. How would you talk about, you know, uh, missiles firing? How would you talk about uh, uh, tanks and artillery? Uh, he would talk about men and their horsemen. You know, in a way to say, this is a well-fitted out army that is coming. And they've got all the equipment, all the artillery necessary to come and, and invade. Anybody else? Oh, it must be clear as mud. Okay, which is good. All right, let's uh, go to Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you tonight that we are able to uh, learn the scriptures and, and to see, Lord, this prophecy and its place in end time events. Lord, I pray that you would help us, that we're not anxious, that we should, we not, be, we should not be anxious over world events today. But really, Lord, it should just spur our, our hearts and our minds uh, uh, to think about your return. And Lord, all these things will be fulfilled in your time. Uh, but we, Lord, we hang on to your promise. And our eyes are upon you, Lord, waiting for your return to take us to be with you forevermore. And Lord, we thank you that you are still in control of world events. And we trust our, and trust our lives and our souls into your care, Lord, knowing that you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could imagine or think. And Lord, we give you praise and glory tonight. May you have your good pleasure in your church. Help us, Lord, during this week, even to make every effort to reach someone with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Blessed is your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Lord.